uh, in uh, in our cancer from our cancer center uh, discuss I think topics that are are so critical in terms of being priorities for our research initiative and start first uh, with Dr. Mark, Mark Gerstein. And as you, many of you know, Dr. Gerstein is the Albert L. Williams Professor of Biomedical Informatics and Professor of Molecular Biophysics and Biochemistry, Computer Science, Statistics, and Data Science. He's also a member of our Genomics, Genetics, and Epigenetics Research Program at the Cancer Center. And uh, his research, I think his innovative research, has advanced uh, the, really the field of computational biology, particularly in understanding data science, data mining, uh, working through large data sets. And you know, as we uh, continue to um, understand the reams of data we get through both cancer genomics and beyond, I think this is uh, leadership, innovation, expertise in this space, I think is is certainly uh, critical uh, in cancer research in our cancer center. So we're really very fortunate to have Mark present us today. So uh, I appreciate the uh, opportunity to, uh, oops, I have to stand in front of this thing here. Yeah, I appreciate the opportunity to talk to all of you and to, I wanna make uh, more connections with the uh, cancer center. And I thought just to start off, I'd start with a, if I can make a picture here, it was just, I, uh, I thought I'd, show you a picture. This is Science Hill. I don't know if you've ever been. This is where I am. <laughs> it's been transformed. This is what it looked like maybe a year ago. So I thought I would just start with some pictures of it. <laughs> bit of a bit of a construction site. Uh, so then I, I just to motivate this, I'll kind of jump right in. I'm going to be talking a lot about passenger mutations. But this is a, a little bit of a quote from um, Barack Obama's uh, State of the Union address while we talked about um, precision medicine. And I, I thought it was kind of interesting in the address. He uh, he didn't uh, talk directly about mutations or genome sequences, but he did mention the genetic code and, and looking at that in uh, particular um, cancer patients and kind of kind of trying to interpret that. And of course, uh, looking at the uh, mutations uh, in cancer genomes is really uh, a very important and also very interesting uh, thing. And that's what I'm going to focus on uh, today. I just want to give you a little context of what these uh, variants are, how to think about them. I mean, obviously, there's tons of variants we have in our genome. There's uh, m most of the variants. You, oops, I'm sorry. There, there. Most of the variants are um, obviously there are germline variants, and these break up into common and rare variants. You you probably all know this. And in uh, cancer, we have somatic variants, uh, usually about a thousand, but there could be ten thousand in, in a tumor. Uh, and often uh, we think of these, uh, a, a group of these uh, variants as being uh, positively selective and kind of uh, driving along the growth of a tumor. And this is the kind of canonical uh, model uh, that we have, uh, where we, we might think we have maybe, say, a thousand um, variants or somatic variants in a cancer genome, but only maybe two to eight are under strong positive selection for the growth of those uh, cells. And we often uh, determine these by looking across a cohort and seeing um, many of the individuals share these um, driving mutations. So this is the kind of canonical view. And you know, I have a reference here to one of um, the famous papers by Vert Vogelstein on this uh, type of subject. And so I'm going to be talking a little bit about this canonical picture, but now I'm going to really focus on what are all those passenger mutations doing? Do they have any um, effect? Uh, and I'm going to be um, looking at the data set really uh, developed from this big uh, international collaboration. It uh, has a very strange acronym, it's called PCOG, but it's actually the um, union of the TCGA, ICGC, uh, cancer genomics efforts. And it, it should have actually, it's kind of a big rollout in a couple of months uh, where they'll uh, sort of describe about almost 3,000 uh, fully sequenced uh, cancer genomes. And these are whole genome sequences, not uh, exomes. And they represent a very large amount of data. And there's, of course, many different types of cancers that this uh, group has uh, worked on. So I'm going to be mostly focusing on this uh, data corpus, but just for kind of clarity, I'm also going to look at one particular one in detail. Uh, this is a particular type of uh, kidney cancer where there's about uh, 35 whole genome sequences done just for this particular type, just to give it a little bit more concreteness. And, and it's also well characterized into uh, different uh, types uh, through the efforts of the TCGA. Um, so this is an outline for the talk, and basically what I'm going to do first is I just want to give you a little background to start on. It's going to be kind of quick, you know, on the annotation of the genome and stuff like that. And also 
a little background on sort of background mutation processes and so forth and how we have to take those into account. And then I really go to the, going to focus on the bulk of the talk, looking at the passenger mutations, their overall functional impact, how they're related to the signature or the mutational signature, and then how we can kind of use or repurpose some of the machinery we have from uh, germline genomics to kind of look at their overall additive effect, okay? So that's what we're going to uh, do today. And so first, a little bit about the annotating of the genome. Now, you probably all uh, know that the genome cont contains genes, but genes are only a very small part of our genome, or about a percent of the genome. And most of the genome actually annotating it is really a different thing than looking at genes. Um, and there's a number of projects that work on this. One of the most prominent is the ENCODE project, which is the, another international effort that aims to annotate the human genome. And on a very, very high level, I'm just going to kind of say what this type of work does. Let's see if I can get the little pointer to, is it pointing? Oh, there, it was pointing. Well, in any case, what this, actually, you know what I can probably do? I think I can move the mouse here. I think that's a little bit easier. Yeah, so what this project does is, it, you know, it kind of, they do a lot of experiments on the, on the genome, and they get some kind of signal of activity of the genome, you know, transcription, binding, and so forth. And then they process the signal in some way, and, the, and in the end, it turns into little regions of the genome that might represent binding sites or places where things are transcribed. And then these things are kind of connected in networks. And the other thing people do with the genome is we obviously compare the human genome to that of the mouse or other organisms, and also compare it amongst different people to get a sense of conserved regions of the genome. And that's kind of an important um, thing. Now, this, the ENCODE project actually spends a lot of time collecting lots of data sets. So one of the key issues here is obviously the data sets that are pertinent to many different cancer genomes have to come from different tissues because the epigenetics and the activity of the genome is very different in different tissues. And so, that, so you can kind of think of it as a kind of a matrix. We have many different tissues. And this particular matrix is actually made up for cancer genomics where there kind of is a rough matching between many of the known cancer types and some of the... Uh, cell lines that the ENCODE crew tends to work on. Uh, and then there's many different assays. And of course, I'm not gonna go into any detail about these assays and so forth. And, you know, people do RNA sequencing, chip sequencing, and a lot of advanced assays like, you know, sort of the high C assay and so forth. And in, in the end, they get this type of annotation that looks like this, where you have, you know, your genes, but you have other regions maybe linked to the genes and they're kind of linked together. And then they kind of maybe put these into these network type of constructions. Now, when you come to assessing the impact of a mutation, um, you might think to yourself, well, just on a very simple level, if the mutation obviously disrupts a functional part of the genome, it's maybe it has a bigger effect. And so you can kind of, in a very simple way, you can kind of think about taking the mutations you might have in a, in a cancer genome and saying, oh, do they impact any of the, the non-coding annotations? Um, are they in... Um, conserve parts of the non-coding annotations. We, we use the word sensitive and ultra-sensitive. We use the word GURP for this. These are all jargon words and so forth. Uh, then if the mutation maybe um, has an obvious way it kind of breaks, uh, functionally breaks, say, transcription factor binding for the motif of a transcription factor, we might score that more highly. And if it occupies a central position in some regulatory network, and so it's a very simple-minded way we might score the um, functional impact of a mutation. Okay, now a little bit more on background mutational processes. So when we look at recurrence in cancer cohorts, we often might look at something that looks like this. We'll have regions of the genome, okay? Annotation blocks, they could be genes, they could be transcription factor binding sites. We have, we have groups of people, we have mutations. And you know what we, we're looking for when we're looking for driving, uh, driving mutations is something that kind of looks like this, where there's a lot of mutations and you kind of see by eye, there's more than you might expect, right? Uh, you know, maybe in this particular cohort or across a, a bunch of cohorts, but you got, this is a very complicated statistical stuff. You have to look at it kind of carefully. And one of the big confounding issues is that the overall, mu the overall mutational process in, the can in cancer is very confounded by many covariates. And one of the, one of the well-known covariates for is replication timing. You know, early uh, replicating regions of the genome tend to mutate less than late replicating regions of the genome. And so you have to take that into account. Uh, so, for instance, you might find this region is actually very overburdened by mutations after you take that into account. Uh, and this is a picture, actually, that shows the correlation between, say, replication timing and the overall mutation rate. And it's, it's actually very, fairly well conserved. And actually, this picture also, so maybe a little hard to see, but it shows the 
overall mutation rate for different people within a cohort, you can see it varies very greatly. And so there's a lot of complicated covariates that you have to take into account when you assess the degree of mutations you have um, in a particular cancer. Now we have, a, I'm not gonna go into detail, I'll just give you a little flavor. We have a lot of models for doing this type of stuff, uh, statistical models and so forth. They, this particular approach we have breaks into two groups. We have these parametric models. We try to explicitly model the uh, mutational process and non-parametric models where you kind of shuffle the mutations around the genome to get a sense of um, maybe what a kind of random non-selected uh, mutational process is. And that's very important because if you want to look for a driver gene or something that's positively selected, you have to have a sense of what is not selected, which is neutral or, or random. And just to give you a flavor of how this might work, you could imagine a model where you might say the amount of mutations you have um, accumulated in a particular genomic bin might uh, follow a simple binomial process. That's a little too simple because, you know, obviously we've talked about the rate of mutations, changes of the genome. So you might have, you might allow that rate to vary according to another distribution. This is a beta distribution. And you might in particular allow the parameters of that distribution to uh, co-vary with various genomic um, covariates such as the replication rate or the level of openness to chromatin. And then there's different uh, permutation schemes. I'm just going to give you a flavor for this type of thing here. So permutation, you might take the genome, you might permute, take the variants in the genome and permute them. Uh, and this is, for instance, the Sanger Center uses this uh, simple type of uh, shuffling. Uh, one of the problems, though, is that, like I said, the different regions of the genome are not that equivalent. So you might do something where you make different regions of the genome kind of equivalent in a way. Maybe they have similar levels of um, similar replication timing, similar levels of openness and so forth, and just shuffle within these bins. And this creates another type of a model. This is a type of model that's more favored by the Broad Institute. Um, in any case, the different types of shuffling models. And this will come up in a little bit as we, as we talk. And this just gives you a sense if you, if you don't uh, if you do just a simple binomial model, this would be the distribution of number of mutation counts you get. And this is the observed real distribution that you actually have. And you can see it's very different from what you get with a very simple model. But if you have a more complicated model that has allows for this varying, you can fit that distribution a little bit better. Okay, so that was a little bit of background, um, some of the stuff that we're doing with genome annotation and uh, background mutation processes. Now we want to talk about this impact of the uh, passenger uh, mutation. So first of all, a little conceptual idea here. So there's this dichotomy uh, in the classical dichotomy of a few drivers that are positively selected, okay? And the thought is that these have very strong um, impact, okay? And then we also have the notion of many other mutations being neutral. But let's just talk conceptually for a second, okay? What else could happen for those mutations? Well. Some of the mutations that you have in the cancer genome, the thousands of them, maybe they're actually negatively, they're negative, they have a negative impact on cancer growth or, or cellular uh, growth. So they would be under negative selection as opposed to positive selection. And we can imagine them being under strong negative selection or strong or, or weak <coughs> negative selection. Okay. And also, we could also have a situation where we have a, a mutation that actually encourages the growth of the cancer, but this mutation, um, is not, doesn't have a very strong effect. It's not a, you know, one of these canonical strong drivers. And so we might have the notion of a weak driver here, okay? And now the, the, one of the problems with this notion of weak and strong is they get very confounded with the notion, the as, notion of ascertainment. So a lot of times we could have a very strong driver, but it might only occur in a few of the individuals. And so we wouldn't see it very well. So it might look very weak. So for instance, the, the appearance of a strong undiscovered driver or a weak, uh, weak driver that was more common would, would be maybe fairly simple. So these are different conceptual categories that we could put things in. Now, we don't know if anything's actually in any of these categories, but what I'm gonna do is just look at some of the evidence when we look across these thousands of cancer genomes and we look at the impact of the mutations and we might think, where do they fit in some of these categories? Okay, are they only in the neutral passenger and strong driver model or do they maybe fit into some other groups? So in particular, if I look at the impact, the functional impact, this is from a functional impact score of all the mutations, one of the things that's actually very striking when we do this is it has a trimodal as a opposed to bimodal distribution. So that, now of course we expect it to be um, 
bimodal, you know, strong, uh, functional, strong functional impact for drivers, lots of other things with weak impact. But actually, that's not the case. There's this middle group here, which they could be passengers, but maybe they have a little bit more functional impact. But actually, what's kind of interesting, too, is if we also take a particular type of cancer, um, so this is a CLL, and we, or a particular group of them, and we fractionate the, the, the cohort into those that have the stronger impact mutations versus the weaker impact mutations, we actually can see a difference in survivability with actually the things that have the um, stronger impact uh, mutations that people tend to survive longer. The implication of this is that those mutations are actually maybe negatively selected. A lot of those mutations are actually in discouraging the growth of the cancer. Now I'm, I'm looking across all the thousands of passenger mutations, not just the few drivers. Uh, another thing we can do is we can take particular cohorts um, uh, of cancer and we can uh, ask, as we have more mutations, okay, uh, in a particular group, um, is the fraction of impactful mutations, does it increase or decrease? Now, if, if the impactfulness of the mutations, if it was completely neutral, if it didn't make any difference, right, we would expect if we have more mutations, we'd have the same amount of impactfulness, right? Okay. But in fact, what we actually observe for some groups, for instance, for lung cancer, we observe a weak negative slope. And the, what does the weak negative slope mean? It means that as we get more um, mu um, mutations, they tend to be less impactful and overall. And the, the implication of that is that there's a, a, there's a tiny amount of negative selection, right? Because, because as we're getting more mutations, we're disfavoring the occurrence of those, some of those mutations that are more negatively selected, okay? And so now I can, if I can graph the slope of this line for many different cohorts, you can see many of the cohorts sit in this area here where they have a negative slope. A few of them are on the positive slope, but most of them are negative slope, okay? Which is maybe a tiny bit of evidence for some weak negative selection. Another thing we can do is we can look at the subclonal architecture of the mutations. So, so each of the mutations is associated with a VAF or variant allele frequency. And that talks about how early that mutation occurred. Did it occur early in the cancer or late in the cancer? Now, what do we expect? We expect that if we looked at, for instance, um, driver mutations, we'd expect if we looked at the ratio of early mutations, to late mutations, that drivers would be enriched in early mutations. That's what we observe, okay? But what's kind of interesting um, is if we look, for instance, um, at um, just high impact mutations, just in general, we also find them somewhat enriched. So maybe, the lot, maybe that has to do with the drivers. But if we look at um, mutations that are not necessarily as impactful, we still see a small enrichment. And then if we break down amongst the different um, groups of uh, genes that you can have passenger mutations in, you can see that tumor suppressor genes have a great enrichment in early mutations. That sort of makes sense. Uh, whereas oncogenes, uh, much less. So the and, and if you think about this, it makes a lot of sense because if you have a random mutation in a tumor suppressor, it's probably going to kill that tumor suppressor gene, and that's going to drive the cancer forward, right? But a random mutation in oncogene, probably not going to make that oncogene function as an oncogene. It probably has to be in that exact particular spot to create it. Hence, you see it kind of um, sort of go down a little bit, evidence for maybe some uh, small amount of negative selection. So then the other thing we can do is we can take a measure of functional impact. Now, this is that GERP word, but GERP is a, a word people use in genomics for uh, conservation. So this is just, as the, as the site of mutation becomes more conserved, that means more functionally important, right? Um, we can ask ourselves, does the mutation tend to occur um, earlier in the cancer? That means, it, so it's a stronger functional impact earlier in cancer. So if we take our driver variants, we get a very nice straight line. So the driver variants, there's a very clear correlation, right? If we take unknown variants, but are in driver genes, in, in genes where there are drivers, we also get a weak upward slope. Again, this is the signatures of positive selection, right? But what's interesting is if I take all of the other mutations in cancer, the thousands of other mutations, and I graph them, I get a tiny negative slope. The implication is as the site of mutation becomes more conserved, 
more functionally important, it becomes less likely to be an early on occurring mutation, more likely to be a late on occurring mutation, implication slightly deleterious, okay? So another type of sort of maybe hint of a small amount of negative selection. So let me tell you a little bit about um, mutational processes. And I told you a little bit about the stuff earlier. So this is a little technical, but we can think of the mutations in a cancer genome as coming, coming about from different mutational processes, different mutational signatures, okay? And the signatures are usually shown like this. And this is a little technical, where you have this spectrum, and I'm zooming in here. Each spot in the spectrum represents the number of mutations originating from a particular trinucleotide. So for instance, this is the number of mutations that, are, that come from ACG that go to T in the middle, whereas this one is, has a, a different trinucleotide structure, okay? And each of, these trinu each of these mutational spectra is associated with different mutational processes. For instance, the one associated with smoking, there's one associated with aging, there's one associated with sun exposure, right? Now, what we can do is we can look at the, an overall cancer, and I'm gonna take kidney cancer to make this a little more concrete here. We can look at its mutational spectra. We have lots of peaks in these C to T transitions. This is well-known uh, peaks here. And this is its overall spectrum. But then we can ask, what are the spectra of mutations that have a very strong impact? Or the mutational spectra of mutations that tend to disrupt particular transcription factor binding sites. So these are particular, this is the transcription factor binding sites for say SP1 or EWSR. And you can see the spectra of mutations is very different that has, the, has strong functional impacts than the overall um, distribution in, in the cancer. And so what the implication of that is, is if I say to myself, I take say the kidney cancer and I ask, oh, let's ask, let's look at the low impact mutations. Those mutations are dominated by signature one, mutational process one. Second, secondly, mutational process five. Whereas if I look at the higher impact mutations, those are the mutations, the medium impact mutations, those mutations are dominated by signature five, a different mutational signature than signature one. So the idea is just shifting the mutational process kind of inexorably changes the functional impact of the mutations, whether or not they're selection or not. And this is a kind of global picture of that where you see um, all the different uh, cancer cohorts here, okay? And you can, these are many different transcription factors. And you can see, the, and each of the different cohorts has different mutational processes going on in it. And so you can see the, how the amount of that particular, um, the transcription factor binding sites is differentially impacted in each of the cohorts, probably to do with slightly different mutational processes. And this picture, I'm going to skip this one, it's a little more complicated, it talks about how there's a change between high and low, pack, low impact mutations in the different cohorts. Okay, so now I just quickly want to go into the end here. So we might say, I've been kind of hinting that the passenger mutations are not passengers. They're, even though they're in the back seat, they're actually directing the car, right? And I've been hinting that there might be weak positive and negative selection uh, involved in these passengers. And this is a little counter to the received dogma, okay? So how can we kind of mathematically show this? Well, one way of mathematically looking at this is see if we could predict if a particular sample is cancerous versus not by taking into account these mutations, okay? And so what we did here is we repositioned a particular type of model that's very commonly used in um, germline uh, genetics, and that's called this random effects or additive effects model. And so you might know, for instance, that people are very su successful in predicting, in relating the genetic contributions to height. But there's many, many variants, thousands of variants related to height. And only a few are related very strongly to height, but if you sum all the variants together in one of these models, you can actually see it accounts for height very well, okay? And that's this model here, where you think about the trait. Here is the particular, va the, the particular variant, and here's some co um, coefficient on the variant. Now I'm gonna just go through this kind of quickly. What we do here is we make a, a sort of similar type of model where we try to predict the trait being essentially growth or cancerous versus not. We relate it to the somatic mutations, okay? And we refine these um, coefficients on each uh, mutation. And there's 
a little bit of mathematical discussion of how this, the random effects model doesn't actually refine a particular parameter, it just puts a random number there. We don't know what that number is. And I'll explain to you a little bit more about that in a second. Um, and then we can actually put, we can divide our model into different groups for say mutations in promoters or mutations in genes or mutations in different groups to compare the relative importance of these different groups, okay? And this is the kind of results we get when we, we do this. So here, this is the amount of variation explained, okay? So if we can explain all the variation, we can completely account for the trait. So, we, so that's the sort of language. When we talk about how much of the variation height we can explain in terms of genetics, we can say it's very high, okay? So we, what we wanna do here is we wanna explain, can we predict if something is cancerous by looking at all the, um, the variants? So if we just take the driver, the driver, the known variants, the drone driver variants, we can explain about 50% of the variation in these cohorts. You can see it varies amongst the different cohorts, but let's just say with the number about 50%, okay? Now, if I take all the variants, now if I, if I go from taking, say, the eight key variants to take that thousand or so in a cancer, I can explain 9% more of the variation. Now, that's not huge, but it's definitely appreciable. So that means that those thousands of other variants in the cancer genome have predictive value to saying that person has that particular type of cancer, okay? Then I can do more. I can say, well, let's split up this, this discussion of variance between coding, coding and promoters, and coding promoters in other non-coding regions. And you can see, if I do this, that I get a slight increase, again, when I add in the, um, non-coding regions, the passenger mutations in the non-coding regions. You know, small amount of added variance. Now, of course, if I figure out the amount of additive variance per um, nucleotide, because the non-coding regions are so big, it obviously falls very low. And obviously the dominant component of explaining the variation is the mutations in the coding regions. Certainly per nucleotide, that's unquestionably true. But there is a appreciable amount of additive variance in the non-coding regions, okay? And then finally, this is a little bit of an abstracted slide, but I can just say that what we can also do here is, as I was saying, this is a random effects model. We're not actually saying which particular mutations are actually contributing to the model. We can actually um, recast this model into a, a more predictive contact, context, um, finding the best linear unbiased predictor and in that context, we can find the, our estimate of the mutations that are contributing most to that additional additive variance. And therefore, we can find a small group of weak, additional weak driver mutations. And when we do this, we basically find that there's about seven or eight more weak drivers in each of the uh, pan-cancer cohorts, in addition to the known drivers, okay? Okay, so let me summarize what I talked about. So today I told you about a lot of some topics in, can, in uh, cancer genomics, in particular, looking at the effect of these uh, passenger mutations. First, a little background on the annotation, background mutational processes, and so forth. And then I looked at the overall impact of the passengers. Key idea, there's a kind of trichotomy of impact as opposed to dichotomy. And just a lot of things don't scale the way we might if they were completely neutral. You know, if you have more mutations, they're actually their impact decreases on average. And you know, they, they, if you look at the early versus late uh, mutations, it's not quite what you expect for mutations not under selection. Then we looked at the impact of signatures and we can just clearly see that signatures naturally give rise to different types of impactful mutations. And so signature change and the different signatures in the different cancers could be giving rise to different types of um, impactful mutations. And finally, we talked about trying to bundle this into kind of a predictive framework using this additive effects model. And I think here what we can show quite uh, precisely is that there's a small additional amount of additive variance explained if we include the many passenger variants into the model, particularly the non-coding uh, passenger uh, variants. And we can actually use this to develop an estimate for the uh, number of uh, weak uh, drivers in a number of the cancers. And uh, with that, I'm going to end as we have more construction pictures. You see this is queuing on the, uh, the building there in Science Hill. 
and I just acknowledge uh, some of the people that worked on that. So there's a lot of people that work on the um, annotation effort related to cancer genomes. This has been work that a lot of people worked on. There's a lot of dot, dot, dots here, but the key people just in my, in my individual lab have been uh, Jing uh, Zhang. Uh, there's also been a collaboration with uh, Shirley Liu at um, Harvard and uh, Kevin White at the University of Chicago. And in the sort of pan cancer thing, there's hundreds of people involved in this, but the particular group that worked on the stuff in particular here is Sushant Kumar, who's associate research scientist in my lab, and Jonathan Warrell. There's also been a collaboration with uh, Gaddy Getz and Jaeger P Peterson. And the um, kidney cancer stuff that we highlighted was uh, done by a, a graduate student in my lab, Chantal Lee, also with uh, Brian Schock, who, is, uh, who was here a, a while ago. Uh, and with that, I think I'll end and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mark. Um, questions? So let me ask you, you know, given uh, what is uh, work deciphering the passenger events, beyond what you described, there's sort of the context, right, that uh, the interactions between these events. How do you model that in? Oh, well, that's a very good, so, so the word people tend to use in German gen genomics is kind of epistatic effect, you know, sort of um, the cor correlation with between different things. So we're not taking that into account in this at all. And I think that's another level of um, analysis. Of course, it makes the analysis more complicated to look at pairs of um, uh, variants or I guess triples and so forth. But definitely that's um, something that people want to do uh, in the future. Of course, it requires you know, more and more statistics, bigger and bigger data set and so forth. <laughs>